I am bored today. It's quite in the news. Elon Musk is uh, reportedly pumping and dumping Bitcoin and Dogecoin. OpenAI just released their paper on Doe and they also pretended to release this short code and model. Let's take a look at this machine learning systems design course offered by Stanford Universities. We might be able to learn a thing or two. So it it is uh, being taught right now at Stanford this semester, uh, winter, or more accurately, I think it's spring semester 2021. So what is this course about? This course aims to provide an iterative framework for designing real work machine learning system. The goal of this framework is to build a system that is deployable, reliable, and scalable. So it is offered for Stanford students, but I think you can send an email and they let you audit it. Hopefully, I think they will post the lecture, the video lecture soon, but let's look at the syllabus. So the first two lectures are introduction and then you have some lecture on data engineering, model development, and eval. And then after that, you have like deployment. And after deployment, there is like case studies, a monitoring and maintenance. As of right now, they are here, so they are almost done with the course. It is a around two months long course. Let's take a look at just the first lecture. We have a slide here. Now, I am a machine learning engineer, so we will try to see if there is anything that I can learn from this. But otherwise, I will try to disagree with whatever it is here as much as possible. And I will try to do a lot, uh, um, actually. The agenda of the first lectures, uh, mostly the cost overview and starting some comparison and contracts between machine learning production uh, versus in research and versus like, traditional software engineering development. It can be short class. Mm, actually, is this year wrong? I think it can be a very long uh, slide back here, like 70 slides, and three the lectures, so she's not in Vermont. What are, what are you talking about? All right, so what's machine learning systems design is the process of defining the interface, algorithm data, infrastructure, and hardware for machine learning systems to satisfy specified requirements. Um, actually, it seems that they are just trying to define everything, so it kind of a uh, statement with no, what is the point? Can you just say, this is what we everything for the learning system? Uh, and specify requirement, meaning it's a reliable, scalable, maintainable, and adaptable. Uh, I don't think this is kind of wrong. Well, some system doesn't need to be like scalable or reliable, or I don't know. And this is not like a special requirements or anything. Any software system, you would want it to be reliable, scalable, maintainable, or adaptable, whatever. Who cares? Uh, so this is one way to look at uh, software system uh, stack into kind of four layers. So at the bottom, you have the hardware and then infrastructure. Uh, in the middle, you have like the algorithm, the software part. Uh, and on the top, you have like the interface or the like, application layer. But you look at the middle, uh, you just deplace it whatever the old kind of algorithm and software with in this case the ML algorithm and what comes with the data or come, come, the model uh, then you I guess you can call this a stack of uh, a machine learning system let's see so this class will cover in the production in the real world and the iterative process and our scale and then changes and solution and it will not teach uh, machine learning algorithm deep learning computational system or the UX. So basically, they imply that this is more kind of grad level or senior level class. So you're supposed to know all about uh, ML and AI and software development in general. And I guess it's only it's only to focus on uh, the different aspect of ML in the industry. Uh, and these are some funny slides. It's actually that whole you know, view cool robot. And the reality is, is like this. Let's see. Um, actually, I don't, don't, really, I don't know if this is correct. I'm doing, I'm building uh, Iron Man suits over here. What are you talking about?
prerequisite. So you have to be knowledgeable about CS and software engineering and programming and like machine learning framework like PyTorch or TensorFlow and probability and statistics too. AI value creation by 2030 is 13 trillion dollars. Um, actually, I don't agree. Uh, now, there's a lot of new like, AI stuff these days, uh, and there's like blockchain, <laughs> and I guess all the uh, big companies are using AI in their service, but there is a lot of hype. We need more people from non CA background in AI. Um, actually, we don't. Now, if you apply AI to any kind of new field, you can apply it to oil, gas, high tech, uh, automotive, like any other fields. Uh, then uh, beside the software engineer on the UX, uh, we often need also the expert in that particular domain. That does mean they are in AI. So you basically, what, what, what does it mean to be <laughs> in AI here? If it's up to me, I, I think we need less people from CX background in AI and not CX background in AI. This is an online class. It taught through Zoom, hopefully they will release the lecture video. So the gradient here, 30% from Simon Um, Actually, I'm not sure if it's a good idea over there. Why are only two or three of someone and what are this assignment about? The final project is an ML application and it's evaluated by core staff and industry expert. So since this is kind of production and industry oriented, uh, I'm guessing that they don't give a shit about like uh, fancy algorithm or improving performance or anything like that, uh, it will be kind of an application oriented uh, criteria or uh, the maintainability or scalability of the system or something like that. The honor code is basically don't cheat. It's not okay to post your Simon solution online. Mm, actually, it's okay. You should have the right to post whatever you want on the internet. Core staff, Karen, Michael, and C, I think they are. Stanford graduate student, Chi Ping is the instructor, she is the software engineer at Sonko AI and I think NVIDIA before that. Uh, she is from Vietnam, her background is very interesting. Uh, she used to work for uh, I think a news publisher or something and she used to travel and stuff. And then uh, she wrote a bunch of best-selling books about her life. Uh, and after a bunch of traveling, I think she just went to Stanford to study computer science. So, kind of very interesting background. I think it would be great if more universities have classes taught by people in the industry. This course is designed to be especially useful for two types of people. I think the first one is uh, whoever that has machine learning experience in research and want to translate to the industry. Uh, so I want, uh, want to find out what the difference between machine learning in the production difference uh, compared to machine learning research. The second type of people are engineers from the traditional software engineer uh, background and want to transition to a machine learning uh, engineering uh, field. Uh, so this lecture will highlight uh, and contrast how ML is done in production versus in research and ML, and, uh, ML uh, development engineering and ML engineering was a traditional software engineering. I actually have both uh, backgrounds in traditional software engineering. Uh, I did a CS in undergrad and I also done uh, some ML research in uh, university. But right now I am doing ML engineering in the industry. The difference in objective is that in research is model performance and in production is the different stakeholders having different objectives. Um, actually, in research, objective is not uh, only model performance. So research in general is about uh, expanding human knowledge. So the goal of this published paper is to discover some new insights, some new wisdom. And a lot of paper is about uh, proposing new model, new architecture, new techniques that improve performance. Sometimes it's not even uh, about improving the model performance or whatever performance we find in this situation. Sometimes about new applications or new explanations. There is a lot of research in the area and many of them don't really care about the practicality or how applicable it is to uh, real use cases. 
Now in production, you have uh, the ML team which cares about accuracies, the sales who will sell more ads, uh, product would care about fast influence and managers um, who want to lay off the ML team. Um, actually, they, they, this is wrong. First of all, the ML team and not always cares about accuracy. So they care about the performance, whatever the metric is, it could be latency, accuracy, compactness, um, whatever. So when here it's a ML team, uh, it might be referring to more like kind of a more research oriented team. Now let's talk about the sale. What does it mean to, to sell more ads here? What kind of business, not business, uh, is about selling ads. Uh, <laughs> Product. What is product here? Is it like product management? This is what really cares about fast influence. That's that's wrong. So product product manager, I think they care about the user experience. Uh, so to make sure that whatever the feature, whatever the product, it uh, meets the market demand or it bring values to the user, and they make sure that everybody in the product team, uh, whatever they are doing, are uh, aligned together. Managers want to lay off ML team. What what is manager here? <laughs> so if we're talking about a mid level kind of managers who like manage the product or the ML team product team, the two engineer team, he or she usually don't they don't want to lay off people. It it is the opposite. People only want to grow their team. They want to retain talented people. But I'm sure that we can just <laughs> maximize the profit by laying off the ML team. Why are we on it? <laughs> Why don't we just lay off other teams instead of the ML team? Why, why don't we just maximize profit by laying off everybody? So, <laughs> that's just <laughs> Okay, next, computational priority in research. We care about fast and high throughput, and in production, uh, it's about fast infusion and low latency. This is uh, an example uh, of what latency means, what throughput means. But I use my own examples. Uh, imagine you have uh, two rice cookers. Do you know what rice cookers are? So you have a big rice cooker that can cook a big batch of rice that can be fed to 100 people in uh, 10 minutes. Uh, and uh, you can cook a small batch of rice if that fit to one people with it too, but it still takes like 5 minutes. Okay. Uh, and you have a second rice cooker that is smaller. It can cook a small batch of rice that can be fed to one person but it can cook it in one minute. So, so the first system, it has a kind of like uh, high latency and high throughput. Basically latency is at least like five minutes to 10 minutes, but the throughput is also high. You can feed like 100 people in 10 minutes. The second system is a small fast rice cooker. Uh, the latency is really small, it's just one minute. Um, but the throughput is also low. You can only feed uh, one person per minute, so that is like 10 people in 10 minutes compared to the first system where like 100 people in 10 minutes. The big rice cooker is an example of what we call a batch uh, processing system. Uh, in practice, usually we want to balance between uh, low latency and high throughput, but there will be trade off there. Latency matters. Mm, actually, uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't think these examples are very convincing. Does 0.2 to 0.6 percent matter? <laughs> I don't know. If you are running a trillion dollar business, sure. <laughs> Third difference: data, 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 data. You want to build an AI system with machine learning. You got to have data. So in research, data is static. In production, data is constantly shifting. Um, actually, it depends on what the application is. Not always constantly shifting. If you are building a face detector, for example, to be able to put on like your camera or something like that, uh, the clean of the face doesn't doesn't shift much over the years. Sometimes it will shift. Sure, say if you build a machine learning system to predict uh, stock price, then sure. The A20 data science dilemma: Most data scientists spend only twenty percent of their time on actual data analysis, and eighty percent on their time finding, cleaning, and reorganizing huge amounts of data with ease. Uh, Inefficient data strategy. The fourth difference is fairness. Fairness is what to have in research and important in production. Um, actually, I think today fairness uh, is kind of important in both uh, in both industry and academia. There was a shift. I think let's say five or ten years ago, uh, people 
you do not really care much about, say, fairness in the software industry or maybe some privacy or something like that. But these days, uh, they are a hot issue. And there are active research in uh, in fairness. So fairness is maybe like its own research area now. And there's a lot of like papers, workshop that raise awareness in the research communities about fairness of ML system and ML algorithm. Each piece of research is usually uh, focus on a single topic so unless you are reading a paper that explicitly focused on a topic of fairness uh, I guess you normally would not find any information relevant to that aspect all right the last one all right the last difference is interpretability uh, it is good to have in research but it is important in production um, actually this is wrong and instead of telling you why it is wrong, I'm going to let the next slide do that. So this is a kind of question here. Suppose that you have cancer and you have to choose between a black box AI surgeon that cannot explain how it works but had 90% cure rate and a human surgeon with 80% cure rate. Do you want an AI surgeon to be illegal? Uh, so who would you pick? Now, I think more than half or like two-thirds of the class pick the first option, the AI search would be the correct uh, answer. <laughs> what this means is that interpretability is not important. Who cares? Who cares? Who cares? All that matter is the end result. What do you think is more important? On one hand, we have the value of an explanation. On the second hand, we have 10% of whatever the value of your life. <laughs> what one is more valuable? Interpretability usefulness can be looked at from two different perspectives. Uh, from the user's point of view, it is about mostly trust. So for example, if I am given these two options, uh, how, do, how do I trust that uh, these are ledgers? Meaning, if somebody tell me, hey, the AI have accuracy of 90%, how do you verify that? 90% number. There is no real way to prove that this 90% number is real or not real or how accurate that number is unless these options are given by God or something. So if I cannot trust what it says here, then I will essentially interpret this as the first option to be a high risk, high reward kind of option. Now from the second perspective, which is from the developer perspective, it's useful to debug and to understand the model work so that we can improve its uh, performance. So at the end, it's all about getting that higher accuracy. All right, let's take a break. Now we're going to look at the difference between uh, ML engineering or ML system uh, compared to the traditional software system. The first argument is that in traditional software system, the code and the data are separate. But in an ML system, they are tightly coupled. So we not only want to test and version code, we also want to test and version data. Um, actually, why the ML system are part code, part data, and it's important maybe to test and version data, but it's not correct to say that the code and data are tightly coupled. It can be like misinterpreted. Uh, a principle in software development is that we want to keep the components, each component to be as independent from each other as much as possible and it's highly like shareable. Right? So for example, you can imagine we can develop multiple ML systems that share the same code base. So the same infrastructure to train the model to do development and to iterate would be the same and the servant structures or the API could be maybe similar too. And the differences are just a uh, double process the parameter the training the configuration. So in that sense, uh, the code and the data uh, are not that tightly coupled and it shouldn't be, ideally, I think it shouldn't be. How do we uh, version data? Uh, like by like this, like it doesn't work. Uh, you can uh, e create multiple copies of larger set and how to merge changes, uh, how to test for test data for correctness, usefulness, how to know if data is model or something, blah, 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 blah. I think what they want to show here is a case of bad data. 
or uh, somebody who tried to uh, poison the data on purpose. Uh, for example, if you were in a company and you want to submit some like some lines of code and you want to inject something malicious, usually your code has to be reviewed uh, line by line by all the people in the team before it can submit it into the code base. But for data, it's literally like large scale data sets. We usually don't have like human or uh, people uh, looking at is like each piece of data and verify if data is kind of contain anything malicious or not. And even if uh, we do that, a lot of time, uh, this piece of malicious is not like in the code. It's obvious like a lot of code, but it can be something very subtle in the text, in the image, in the audio, in the video, and it's, it might not be like humanly recognizable. And then some engineering challenges with large ML models. By the way, like ML model doesn't have to be large, uh, but if it's large, then it's it well to fit, to fit on device. It consumes too much energy, it's too slow to be useful. ML production myths. The first one, deploying is hard. Deploying is easy. Deploying is hard. What is, is it a myth? Deploying is easy. Deploying reliably is also easy. Mark my words. Not just machine learning system. Any software system, deploy them reliably is easy. I don't see what's the point of this myth. You only deploy one or two ML models at a time. Okay. Booking.com 150 mod over a thousand models. This is this is kind of misleading. Okay. You are in the deploying one or two models at a time. This like by you, I mean you are as an engineer, not like you as hey, you are an Uber, you are Google, you are Netflix. Like this company, they have like tons of machine learning tasks, tons of machine learning system. Obviously, they deploy a bunch of them. So one model for translation, one model for for detection, one a bunch of model, two three model for two two three model for content valuation. What what kind of myth is this? Myth number three: If we don't do anything, model performance remains the same. Concept tripped. Concept tripped. Train a model on data changed two months ago and test on current data. Um, actually, I guess it depends on the application. Okay, so if you're doing a uh, face detection for your uh, phone, for your digital camera, it's like the face doesn't change that much over the year, I think. Or if you classify dog or cat. But if your application is, say, to predict stock price, then sure, a uh, performance will change. Myth 4, you won't need to update your models as much. Death of... <laughs> SE deploy 50 times a day, Netflix a thousand times a day. AWS every sitting point. AWS every 11.7 seconds. What? What? Ah, uh, this is silly. Ah, uh, this is silly. Okay. You will not update your model as much. And by you, I don't mean AWS or Netflix. Like they have a ton of models. And I'm not sure what's the point of this because like it's not that much different from uh how frequent you update uh, the software system that is not an ML system. Making an update to your model, uh if it's a major change, even if it's a minor change, you require some time. Uh there are people that you have to ask so that they press that approve button before that update goes live. And that doesn't happen 50 times a day for a single model, or every 10 minutes. But actually, it take, take, might take a week, right? Because when you approve a model or change the approval to, to, to be launched, we're not gonna roll out it to all server immediately. So for the big company or big product, like say Google search, Google translation, or Netflix or whatever, they usually roll that out that change gradually, region to region, over a couple of days, over a week, until okay, uh, it's propagated to all server. Okay, so not, not every 10 seconds, so you're not updating your model every 10 seconds. Most ML engineers don't need to worry about scale. I'm not sure what this means, so I am going to say that this is wrong. ML can magically transform your business overnight. Magically possible overnight. No, what are you talking about? It can. Let me give you some examples.
All right, that is the end of our, our first lecture, an overview of machine learning system designs. I'm gonna grade this lecture on a scale from a multi-layer bisectron to a large-scale uh, transformer network. I'm gonna grade this lecture as a random fortress.